Okie dokie, let's get rid of. Go back into the office. And I think I know we still have some of you that are still arriving. Uh, I'd like to do a quick check on everybody. Can you let me know in in the chat if you don't mind how you're doing? Please. Uh, Melanie, I agree with you on that one. Uh, quite a bit of sitting. That's the truth. Perfect. Thank you for joining from Athens. And yes, we have a lot of uncertainty coming up uh, for the school year. Um, I don't know if you all saw the Los Angeles Unified School District uh, announced a couple of days ago that they're starting off the school year with remote learning. So they're not even going to try to uh, uh, play the remote learning or hybrid or face to face. They just got out in front of it and said, we're doing uh, we're going straight to remote learning and then we'll go from there. So. Um, all right, well, you all just hang in there. We're, we're gonna spend another hour together for part two of what we covered on Monday. Uh, I wanna go ahead and um, share with you all my screen. So uh, hopefully, can everyone see uh, the screen with the slide deck now? Yes, okay, perfect. So again, we're gonna use Pear Deck. Um, so basically what's gonna to happen today, we'll do a brief recap of what we went over on Monday in regards to what restorative practices are, um, why they are a good, really culture and policy shift in our school districts, and then also what the, um, the solution fluency process is, which is a process that was uh, originally developed by a very, a very close friend of mine. And uh, we'll redefine the five areas within the context of restorative practices. And then I have a link to a template that I have available in a Google Docs format that you can copy. Uh, it's in a Word um, format that you should be able to copy. And then I will upload into our chat a PDF of that as well. So let's go ahead and get started um, here. Okay, so remember on your machine or device or computer, you're going to want to go to joinpd.com. And then our code is Tango Hotel Sam Zebra Zebra.
Lauren, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I I um I use Pear Deck all the time. Uh, there's two. There's Pear Deck and Nearpod, uh, and I think both are absolutely fantastic. Um, they're similar, but then they have a few functional differences. But the most important thing is that they allow for interactivity with um, Google Slides, with PowerPoint, and Office 365. Um, and then I don't know if you noticed when I launch it, there's instructor pace and there's student pace. So you can actually have lessons that you design in it specifically with the intent of having a student just kind of go through that process at their own pace and allow for some of the interactivity. So it's actually pretty cool. Uh, OK, so let's go ahead and get started here. So if you'll recall uh, from Monday, um, you all share with me why you were here. Um, we had the four agreements, uh, which were be impeccable with your word, don't make assumptions, don't take things personal, and always be your best. And we went through the characteristics of being uh, an empathetic and attentive listener versus dismissive. And I did get feedback from one of you that you adopted or utilized this process pretty much right away, and it yielded a, a positive result. So I'm happy to hear that. Um, I, I will say that the more that you adopt um, an empathetic and attentive listener um, mindset, if you will, or protocols, uh, you will find that it allows you to be even that much more communicative, uh, which is interesting. It's more communicative by me being authentic, attentive and empathetic listening rather than me speaking. So, um, so I'm just happy to hear that as well. And so obviously I'll just kind of go through. Remember, it was the whole idea around I want to hear you rather than I want to fix you. Uh, asking questions like, is there more, rather than saying it could be worse, uh, what or how did it make you feel versus dismissive way of saying you'll be fine. And then uh, it sounds like you're saying, uh, and then asking the question, is that accurate? And when you say it sounds like you're saying, you're repeating what that person is saying to you. And I did a workshop yesterday for a school in Oklahoma, and one of the things that we all determined with this one right here is that in the areas of the four agreements, those that had marked don't make assumptions and don't take things personal. This right here is one of the ways to mitigate that effect in regards to those four agreements is you repeat what the person is saying, which means that they know that you're attentively listening, but then you're also asking if that's accurate, which for us internally, that will help us alleviate any potential um, confusion or lack of communication around things that we might be taking uh, personal. And then of course we touched on a little bit of the differences between uh, school policies that uh, generally are more punitive rather than restorative. And then I took you all through the solution, solution fluency process, which was define, discover, dream, design, deliver, and debrief. And so what I want to do today is, uh, is the following. Oh, and then just to kind of touch on the last few things is we looked at understanding conflict and how within those concentric circles, when we don't address conflict, uh, in a productive, uh, in, in what I would say a productive and sustainable capacity, those concentrics, it, it grows. The conflict can grow to affect more than just the individuals that were directly involved or the group that was directly involved, which goes into the whole idea around what are the different types of conflicts uh, that we covered. And so now what I'd like to do uh, for part two is the following. So first, um, there were some questions that came up around restorative practices. And um, and so I added this slide here because I wanted to be clear on a couple of things in regards to uh, the whole idea around restorative practices, the myths versus the facts. So the myths are on the left. Those are some of the more common things that are associated with uh, restorative practices, you know, as far as like people just sitting in circles uh, and talking about how they feel uh, that it's soft and doesn't bring justice for the victim. Uh, and then it takes away from a teacher's authority when in fact the facts are on the right, that it is actually a problem solving process. I mean, there's there's other, there's many ways that we can identify a process towards problem solving. This is a way I would, I would argue that what we're covering here, it should be in your, I would say in your library or within your um, human resource, uh, human resource protocols for uh, problem solving. This is a way, not the way. So I want to be clear on that part. Um, and it does involve much more than talking about your feelings, because ultimately talking about your feelings is if you only do that, then that's not a pathway towards uh, reconciliation, among other things. Uh, and then, of course, the goal is deeper understanding, and it's meant for restoration and reconciliation, not 
uh, not unsustainable punitive measures. Uh, and we talked about that on Monday a little bit where students will sometimes uh, repeat an unexpected behavior knowing or anticipating what the quote unquote punitive measure is. And I believe I did share with you all the story of where at my last school there was a student that absolutely hated school uh, except for really my class and one of my my close friends who was a colleague at the school as well. And so this student, if they knew that, um, because we were on a block schedule, if it was the day that the student did not have us, the student would exhibit behaviors that they call discipline problems. I would say that they were unexpected because I didn't, that student didn't demonstrate those in my class, but it was a way to say, okay, I don't wanna go into the classes that are trauma inducing or in, uh, anxiety inducing. So I'm going to exhibit a behavior knowing that they will be punitive towards me and that my quote unquote punishment will be in school suspension or I get sent home, which is the goal of, the, of me doing it anyway. I don't wanna have to go into those classes. So that's where you get a whole idea around um, the unsustainable component of punitive measures, as well as the final goal there, which is you know developing sustainable and transformative mechanisms for school, class environments, school environments. And as you all saw in those concentric circles, uh, if you look at school on a larger context, as far as school and the community, it actually helps with that as well. So the next thing I wanna do is, um, here is the uh, link. So you have two links here, and I will put it in our chat as well to the uh, template for um, the solution fluency. So you'll need this in order for us to go through uh, some of our scenarios later. And I just put it in the chat as well. Oh, it's uploading. I'm putting in a chat a PDF version of it. And just for ease, um, if you can't get to the Microsoft version, that's what you need. I'm going to put that here in the chat as well. Now, when I exported it as a DLCX file, it threw off some of the formatting. But the main thing is you all will have it and you can tinker with it and move it around to where it will uh, work best for you. And for those of you that use uh, Google Docs primarily, that link at the top, kens.link slash rpd5 template will take you to a google doc where it'll force you to make a copy of it so i'll give you all a moment to get either download the files from our chat here or get that file from there and then just can you give me a uh a, can you give me some sort of visual confirmation that you've gotten one of the files please Yeah, even a thank, uh, thank you, Brittany, even a thumbs up in the chat is good enough. I just want to make sure that you all have it before we move on to the next uh, next round. Um, what we're going to do next is go through those protocols as they specifically apply to restorative practices. Uh, then I have a question and then we're going to go through scenarios. And if I plan my timing correct, and that's a big capital I and a capital F, if, <laughs> We should we should be able to cover all of this in about 35 minutes because I wanted to allow a solid 10, really 10 minutes. And if we have a little bit more, that's even better towards the end to answer any specific questions you all have. And then maybe if you all have had any sort of challenges within the context of your school environment that we can uh, uh, we can together here go through the D5 process um, for something that is real, specific and significant to you personally. Uh, I did my best to get some scenarios that are likely to happen um, on a more broad scale uh, for us uh, to work through. So, so I have three that have successfully obtained the file.
Uh, okay, so Melanie, can you um, like turn on your microphone and or your camera and tell me what what um, I want to help you because I do want you to be able to get the file. So one of the things I clicked said I needed to request it. It came up with a Google Doc, so I sent the request. Oh, okay, I'm going to fix that right now. Just right. sharing thing. So sorry. Okay. No, no problem. I thought I was doing something wrong, but then. No, okay. you're not. It's me. Okay. It's not. Right. It's not you. It's me. Okay, well, I've done that myself a million times, so hopefully that's an easy fix. Uh, anyone I think can you? Okay, um, refresh or go to it now, and it should work this time. Yeah, I just got the request to make a copy, so I'm good to go. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. That's why I wanted to be sure. Thank you so much. Okay, so yeah, any of you that went to the Google Doc, just refresh. And then it'll say it'll it'll pull up and make a copy. I was uh, the permissions. I forgot to change that, so I apologize. Hi Ken, this is Elizabeth. I just wanted to let you know that I'm unable to chat for some reason. It just says administrator has disabled chat for one or more users. Uh, I'm sorry. Re repeat that one more time, please. It just says I'm unable to chat. Like I have no. Um, I'm unable to chat anywhere. It just says administrator has disabled chat for one or more users. But I'm not really familiar with Microsoft Teams, so this is. I wasn't able to chat in the last session either, and I didn't want to. I was kind of late joining, so I didn't want to interrupt you. But this time, it's not allowing me to chat either. So I just want to let you know I do have the file, though. Okay. Um, hang on one second. Let me. That's me. I don't know why it's doing that. But I'm able to hear, and I can also, you know, do a pair deck, and um, I have your file. So. Okay. I no just want you to know I'm and participating. I, I just can't chat. No, it's all good. I mean, I, I, you know, part of it is I want, I want you all to be able to contribute. So I, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so feel free, you know, you just, when we're going to have a discussion, feel free to just, you know, it's only a few of us in here, which is actually good considering the content we're covering. So you can just use your microphone. It's totally fine. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. So just to be clear, everyone is good to go now. Um, you either have the PDF from the chat, the Word document from the chat, or you were able to get the Google Doc of the template that has the protocols. So real quick, let's just review through those protocols, um, which are, remember, it's the, um, the solution fluency process. So there's five components to it. And, um, that's why I call it D to the fifth power. Uh, and so this is one, and you have this on your doc now. So if we're going through restorative practices, the first step is defined. So we got to define the problem for what it is, develop a deeper understanding, uh, uh, breaking some of the tasks that we've done before that are associated with punitive and then create a deeper understanding of the, of the process itself. So it's things around asking those questions. And again, you all have this on your uh, on the document now as well. That's why I was sharing with you on Monday. Don't worry about taking notes. Let's just be mindful of the situation and, and be immersed in experience because I was going to get this to you uh, as well. Anyway, then, of course, when it comes to discovering, it's the discovery process. We're getting background information, information acquisition, evaluation of the sources of that information that we're getting it from. And then of course, as always, it's asking the right questions. Now, I want, I want to emphasize with all of these, these are guideline questions. I would say for all of you, the perfect scenario for you is to use these as guideline questions and adapt them to be more specific to your environment. Um, the main thing here is looking at the whole process as a holistic uh, mechanism for uh, restorative justice and restorative practices. And then we go into the dream phase, which is, you know, imagining, exploring and being creative on what the po potential solution could be. Um, and in many cases, I used to always even say this to my students, if you don't visualize it, you can't actualize it. And so in the context here, the most important thing with the dream phase is to really visualize what potential outcomes there could be and then backwards essentially backwards design or backwards plan to reach those which is why design is the next part of the process is once you've gathered all that information and you synthesize it into solutions you've dreamed of what it could be now it's time to create the measurements goals and accountability with it and then of course once you have it there's a delivery process which is you know designing something and then making it uh uh showing your work basically and then we're going to again we're going to go through this in uh in just a moment and then a debrief which i think is a critical component and that is reflection i mean it's literally as simple as that so you all have the documents we've gone through the process what i wanted to ask you all here is uh i wonder 
is this process something that you could say I can use as a template or I can use as is within the scope of your um, the scope of your uh, your school environment? So if you don't mind typing in that, I would appreciate it. So Lauren, I see you disconnected and came back with, are, are you still connected to the Pear Deck? Okay, perfect. Okay, and thank you all for your contributions. Uh, many of you are just saying you can use it as is, you can use it as a template. My goal in sharing that with you was exactly that. It's a template. If you can use it as is, perfect. What I think many of you may end up finding is that as you work your way through those, those processes and engaging in different uh, restorative um, components uh, for conflict resolution, among other things, you may find that some of the things aren't as efficient as maybe making modifications. The key there, again, I wanted, the, which is a purpose of these two part sessions was I wanted to give you all a solid foundation uh, to work from, but I'm always, I'm always mindful of and always encouraging that, you know, it is a way, not the way, and there may be opportunities or uh, there may be a necessity for you to modify some of the questions or even modify some of the process. Oops, sorry. All right, so now let's go into our scenarios. So what I want to do next is the following. So you have access to the documents. Uh, what I want us to do is two parts. One is utilize the documents for um, um, the guides to the scenarios we're going to do. And then the perfect scenario is all of us can have a conversation around how, how we would not only solve the scenario situations that we're going to deal with, but, but work our way through that five-step process. Uh, we have enough time for sure for one, um, because this is what I do when I'm face-to-face, -face, is we sit together, whether it's a big room or small, we sit together, you have access to the document, I present the scenario, and then together we just work our way through that document. So let's do that here as well. So here's the first scenario, and I, I'll, you all, if you want, you can read it, or I'll read it as well, just for, uh, the sake of um, making sure that everyone uh, not only can read it, can see it, but hear it. Uh, two students were working on a project and the teacher noticed one of them not doing very much work. The teacher decided to discuss this with the students, at which point one of the students claimed they had done all of the work because the other refused to. Upon this accusation, the other students spoke up and said their partner had been uncommunicative and uncooperative and had even claimed at one point they were better off doing the work alone. Now, my guess is many of you have probably seen a scene or even been a part of a scenario like that before. So let's work our way through uh, the, the, the solution fluency process uh, in regards to this. So if you don't mind, make sure you have your document open um, and we can go from there. So first, we want to define the problem, develop a deeper understanding uh, and, and create um, and, the, and create a part of the creation of an understanding of the process. So first of all, obviously what happened? And again, you can turn on your microphone to answer some of these questions. So are we, did you want us to fill it out on the form or did you want us to have a conversation? Um, no, let's have a conversation. Um, if you want, if filling out the form would only be for your own use because we're not in a position to where we could fill it out and then you would share it with me and then I'd put it on the big screen, uh, which is what I do when it's in person. So in this case, uh, and I apologize if I, uh, since I, I, I clearly didn't, uh, I wasn't as communicative about this. What we're doing right now is we're we're as a group kind of talking through the process. You have the document so that when the session is over, you will have gotten a deeper understanding of it. We've been able to define it. Essentially what we're doing in this session is these five steps. We define it to begin, 
and then we're working through the uh, you know the the dream, the design, the uh, the, uh, the I mean the whole process, if you will. So we're working our way through the whole thing. So for now, I would like for us to be able to just have a conversation with each step solving with this scenario to start. If you want to fill in a document, you can. But but again, for the sake of the fact that you all, we don't have enough time for you to share your document with me so I can put it up on the big screen and everyone could see how each other uh, worked their way through the process to solve a common problem. So under the circumstances, we're going to have to be limited to uh, voice and video. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. I just wondered because there was a big silence there. So I wanted to just be clear. Yeah, no, and thank you for asking. So right now for this scenario, let's just define. So obviously, uh, you know, I mean, I, how can I put this? Let's work our way through each question so that everyone can just contribute and we're gonna work our way through the whole process um, and identify a potential resolution. So obviously what happened here? So two students who were assigned working together were not working together, basically. Bingo, it's literally that simple. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, and then, of course, who was involved? The two students. Where did the conflict take place? In the classroom. In the classroom. Perfect. And then, of course, the question we would ask the students, what were the events leading to the conflict? Based on this scenario, it looks like what? Mm. To me, it kind of looks like there was just some sort of miscommunication um, with them. They just didn't divvy up the work properly or something like that. Perfect. And and honestly, that that's the key there, because for those for those of you that have been in the classroom and again, this has probably happened to us when we're put in a group, we have to work with a partner in some cases. Um, and I used to actually tell my students this, not necessarily using this specific terminology. I'm not so much focused as the end product as I'm thinking about the process. So clearly there was a disconnect in the process that one, the one student that wasn't doing the work said that their partner was uncommunicative and uncooperative. And so then now, so, so we've defined the problem. There's probably a communication, uh, the, 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 the base problem is probably communication because we know what happened, who was involved. We know the end result of who's involved. The conflict took place in the classroom and then the events leading up to it were probably a lack of communication. So now the discovery phase, we'd want to go through, okay, so what is everyone's specific account of the incident? Now, granted, this is going to be somewhat limited because uh, of the description, but we can look at it and say, we would ask, you know, the one student who is working on the project, what was their specific account? And then we would ask the other student who felt that they were, uh, they that was not working what their specific account was but the key here is uh, which you can probably tell a little bit in here beyond just what everyone's specific account of the was what was each person thinking and what were they probably feeling and so that's a question to share with all of you based on this what would we look at is what was each person thinking and feeling uh, one person definitely did not feel valued or heard and the other person was like i'll just do it myself because you're not contributing right and i'm i'm sure at that point too they were starting to feel a little bit frustrated which is why they would start to, to kind of act out like that right and don't we all do that sometimes where we feel that we are not valued that we just we disconnect from the situation Yes, and they may have the feeling too that it's, you know what, it's just easier if I just do it. Right, right, right. Perfect, thank you. And then of course the next question, is there a history between the parties involved? Now we don't know that for sure, but is there a likelihood since there are two students in the same class? I think this is like the most important part of this question. <laughs> is of this question. Is there a history to it? And it reminds me of something we do in history class, which is there's like at the beginning of the year, there's a luncheon fight, but you look at it from all the different perspectives of the people that were in the cafeteria during the fight. And so kids learn the context of what was happening in the town, like somebody's dad got laid off and the other guy's dad fired him. And it gets very complex, but it really Bingo. helps unpack it. 
and and thank you for sharing that. And that's precisely why I think one, you know, I mean, that's why I discover is 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 part two. It's like, let me get an overview of what exactly happened. And then now let me see if there is any what I call hidden stories or missing information. Um, and then this question, yes, is there a history between uh, the parties involved? And then, if, then the final question, has anything happened since the incident? Now, given the information we have here, uh, has anything happened since the incident? No. No, yeah, exactly. Not that we know it. So nothing's happened since the incident because it was discovered um, basically while it was occurring. All right. So you see, you all see, even when I was just talking about it, we're starting to get a bit, a, a, a paint a picture here. And so then next, the dream phase would be, um, now we need to explore possible um, solutions. So this, the question that we would ask uh, the students would be, what have you thought about since that incident? Now, if it's in the immediacy, it's what, tell me what you're, you know, going back to thinking and feeling, tell me what you're thinking about what's going on. Um, but now for us, <coughs> as far as working with students it would be you know what future outcomes are are you looking to happen so what will, what what future outcomes would we be looking to happen in this incident i'm thinking that maybe we want to encourage them to still work maybe not with each other depending on the history or maybe we do want them to but um better allocating the work or if they are stuck at a wall maybe they could approach us before we have to approach them next time exactly what you touched on was what i would be looking at um for sure towards the uh the, the debrief um and then the, finally you know why do you feel this is the best solution I think in terms of both of those questions, obviously it's a little bit harder because we have the scenario, but we're not, and we're not in a position to talk to the students. But again, this is why it's just a template, because to me, number one, I don't necessarily think that as much as I know that we uh, support or we would like students to collaborate, I guess the question I have for all of you is, should we always have students collaborating? I guess I, I want to play devil's advocate and say, yeah, I want all of the students in my room to be able to be able to work with everybody else in the room. And it's really uncomfortable at the beginning of the year, but mm -hmm. by the end of the year, they're like, they're, they thank me for it. Um, because in the real world, we don't get to pick and choose who we work with most of the time. So. Yes. Thank you. I agree. I agree. Anyone else? I'm just uh, kind of countering that. I must admit, I've always been kind of the type of person that does prefer to be working on my own. Um, but when I joined the working world, I quickly learned like that that was a skill that I I needed to work on more as I went through school because I usually did avoid it. Um, so I think it's definitely important to have a balance. I, like I said, enjoy working on my own, but I definitely think it's valuable for them to know how to work with each other and be able to comfortably communicate together. So yes, I, I and to share with you all, I, I think it's good for uh, us to encourage collaboration, um, but it has to be with an intent and for a purpose rather than just for the sake of collaboration. Um, I remember I would give students some cases with certain projects. I would give them the option. Hey, you can work together or you can do it alone. Some students want to work alone. I know when I was in school, uh, especially in high school, there were a lot of cases where I didn't want to work with a partner because uh, and it wasn't uh, out of selfish reason. It was just like I, I, I want to do this on my own. I want to see myself be successful in uh, taking this uh, learning path. Um, and part of that, my guess, and thinking back now as a middle aged adult was to essentially develop mechanisms for confidence in myself. Um, so, you know, I think in this context here, if we're looking at, you know, what future outcomes could we look to happen? I mean, to me, one of the things that I to share with you all that I would probably look at for the students is I would ask the question, what do you need in order to accomplish the project? Can you do it together? or is it better for you to do it alone? 
And then I would follow that up with, you know, whatever their answer is, why do they feel that that's the best solution? Um, and so then now let's go into design and we're probably only going to have time to work our way through this one scenario. Um, so now, now that we've done our, our, our information gathering and things of that nature, now it's time to put together um, a actual solution. So um, in this context, what do you all think needs to happen in order for things to be made fair or to be made right? This is a tricky one because I don't know if uh, mm -hmm. fair is such a, <laughs> it's a difficult word to define, right? Um, right? And and like you said, I think what needs to happen, like there's like the repairing of the relationship, but there's also like the work that needs to get done. And so maybe at this point, they don't necessarily need things to be fair. They just need some like chill out time and like you said, to maybe be working on it in independently, but then maybe come back later after the task at hand or whatever is done so that they can, I guess that's maybe the debrief section. Um, another thing that we didn't mention that I think is important, like the teacher's role in all of this, like maybe clearer directions or roles at the beginning would have helped them bypass some other problems. I don't know. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, a big part, uh, you know, and, and that's where we get into the debrief aspect for us as educators is thinking back to what are the ways that we can predict a potential conflict? And then what can we do to mitigate the likelihood of those happening? So to your point, which I'm in full agreement, is a whole idea around am I clearly defining what the project is, clearly defining what the expectations are, and clearly defining what the roles are. I'll, I'll share with you all every project that I had groups of students do when I was in the classroom, there were two assessment components to it. There was the what are your individual contributions and then what does it look like for the group? That way you had individual accountability and group accountability. And because I knew that if you just say do a group project together, that that the 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 volume of effort and work put into it is not going to be fair or equitable. So I think that's a great point is, you know, what what with my thing here, let's say if I were an administrator at the school is I would have encouraged the teacher to think about, you know, how did you communicate what your expectations were around this project prior to the students engaging in the work itself? And so here, yes, it's fair. I mean, fair is subjective. I would say even fair and equitable. Um, I would add. Um... Definitely going back to figure out what the teacher expectations and if she um, verbalized that to the students and did they have an understanding. But I would also want those two students to think about the way that they work together. So like because there could be another time where these two students have to work together again. So they should probably have a conversation and say, OK, next time we work together, I'm going to do this. You can do this. And like just making those. Um, setting those expectations for those times that they have to meet with each other so that they can kind of have an understanding. Okay, now we're back together as partners again. Okay, remember, this is what we talked about last time. So this is what we did and this is what we're going to do this time. Exactly, and thank you. And I, I would even add, that's a prime example of where being uh, an, uh, an attentive uh, and authentic listener really comes into play. It is really, really thinking about, OK, am I am I seeing and am I hearing what my classmate is telling me so that that will help me be more informed for uh, the next time? Um, and then in the context of the design phase, so those are we're, we're talking about steps necessary uh, for fair and equitable. This is one to, to the point that was just made where the question is, how might we work together to facilitate those steps? And that's where we're going to get input from the students around. These are the steps we need to take. What do you think is uh, needs is necessary to make it happen? And then how might we work together to do it? Um, and that 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 working together could be anything from access to resources to time uh, to, you know, anything along the lines of I need I need support because I don't know what to do or things like that. So let's uh, let's shift over to deliver. And uh, let's say we do have a solution. Of course, how do we proceed with our solution? I mean, I granted these it's it's hard to identify some of these things because we're not talking to the students, 
But another one here that I think is uh, great for us to briefly share thoughts around is how do we keep track of progress and what accountability measures should be in place if we were working through this process with these two students? Because that's one of the areas where you create sustainability. Um, so I wanted to add to Lacondria's comment about like, okay, you're, they're going to have to work with each other in the future. So what are some steps we can do then? And I think the keeping track of progress would be the reflection piece yeah. for both, both this time and for the next time that they do it. And the accountability might be their plan of action for the next. So, okay, we're not going to do it this week. We're too irritated with each other, but a week from now, you're gonna have another similar activity and you're gonna to have to have something in place. And then, you know, sort of tracking and comparing and contrast, contrasting your reflection pieces from both of those different sessions. Right. And then of course, that to your point, that follows up with the next two questions, which are what challenges might we have on the way with that? And then what procedures need to be in place to address those potential challenges? And we all know, especially if you, uh, you know, in the mo in, for the most part, a classroom teacher, um, you know, this is where for a classroom teacher, an administrator or whomever is overseeing, let's just say discipline on campus has to be in a position to support teachers having the space to be able to do some of these things. Um, I think in some cases to the point that that was just made as well is encouraging students to keep um, some type of a journal you know, recording, this was a scenario, this is what I was thinking, this is what I was feeling, and this is what happened. Um, and then that's how they can create layers of personal accountability. I will share with you all on this, one of the things that I did back when I was in the classroom is I used to always tell my, uh, my students that, you know, part of having a good friend on campus is that they will hold you accountable. Uh, and it's not the tough love thing, it's if they see, for example, a potential conflict arising, they're going to go and, and mitigate the chances of it escalating by, by helping you stay grounded or helping you take a deep breath or saying you need to pause before it escalates or something like that. Uh, I go, and it's not a function of breaking up a fight, if you will. It's a function of having some sort of measures in place so it never even gets to the point where it, you resort to uh, physical violence. So there's a whole number of ways that we can do that. The key here is the, that we want the students, in this case, to develop mechanisms for uh, personalized accountability and predict. I mean, think about how we do this when it comes to reading comprehension and reading and teaching reading where we have them read and we want them to predict what's going to happen. This is a behavioral prediction. If we're going to do this, what are the challenges that might be in place and how can we mitigate the potential of those challenges stopping us from making our progress? Um, and then, of course, you get to the debrief part, which is the reflection. Uh, and this is asking the students, you know, what have you learned about this experience? Um, how has it changed you? Maybe the other person, maybe the school and maybe the community. Uh, and then what will you do differently? And then how do you feel about the entire process? Uh, and then I'll go to the last one. Um, actually, that is the last one. That's the debrief. So I'm going to go to the next scenario for you all to just kind of take a look at because unfortunately that quick we only have 15 minutes left because I want to I want to be in a position to answer any questions that you all have uh, and especially as it relates to this the next scenario um, is something that unfortunately applies uh, in schools all around the world so a mixed gender group of students from different grade levels have allegedly made racist comments towards a classmate. This is not the first time, and since the issue was not previously addressed, it escalated to them forming a social media group in which the comments continued, including a desire for this student and others like them to be removed from school. As a result, the victim, victims do not feel safe on campus and they feel threatened. So give that scenario some thought and I'd love to hear your thoughts on if we were to apply the solution fluency process, what are some of the steps? You don't have to work through all five, but what are some of the steps you would look at doing to address this situation from a restorative practice component? Because I will share with you all, most of the responses I see to situations like this are either nothing, which is most of the time, unfortunately, and you know that's not good enough, or it's strictly punitive where that mixed gender group of students gets suspended. 
Well, not this exact situation, but um, I, I shared with you guys last time, it was my first year teaching last year, and I did have students within my classroom um, making comments about one another's like citizenship and their immigration status. Um, and that quickly came to my attention. Thankfully, a few of the students felt comfortable enough to even tell me it was going on because I unfortunately didn't hear it or even see anything, honestly, that I thought looked like that was happening. Um, and my automatic reaction, just because I must admit I didn't expect it from that student, was to talk to the student and they quickly told me I don't know why I said that. And that's when I involved their parent so I could kind of get them on board with me. Um, and we had them write a letter to the other student. They were specifically talking about one other student um, as well as having the parent talk to them at home. So that was kind of where we went with it. But I must admit that I felt like I should have done a better job following up on it. Um, after the letter, it was like that was it. So if you guys have any advice, or I'll definitely be listening to what ideas you have as well. So you're not alone in that. That's, I've heard that um, a lot. Uh, I think there's a couple of things. One, if you think about the way you handle it, you already touched on some of the processes that we've gone through. Uh, obviously, as you just shared, there's a few more things that uh, might have helped it be um, more sustainable and more effective because I don't I don't think look, I don't think what you did was wrong because ultimately you did the best you can. Remember four agreements always be your best. That was that was the best that you could do under the circumstances, given the information that you had at that particular time. Um, I think there's a lot lot to be said about this specific scenario in how. Uh, a lot of students, you know, it's um, this essentially equates to a version of bullying and how students are able to understand uh, the impact that their actions and their words take, as well as the effect that it has on not just the school, but the community, because you even just shared that you uh, got the parents involved as well. So, you know, for me, it would be a function of understanding you know, the differences between, uh, you know, I guess for me, it would be the understanding that words can be hurtful just as much as, you know, a punch in the face. Uh, you just don't see the damage and um, recognizing and understanding that that we all have differences and that in most cases, um, you know, our differences are uh, not only a part of a part of identity, make up who we are. So, you know, I think I think, and by the way, I will say that those types of conversations I think should be occurring in classrooms, even as young as year two. So second graders, mm -hmm. minute you can start verbally communicating is when you should start having those conversations. Um, I don't have an easy access to it to share it with you all, but there's plenty of research. Uh, you even go back to, and I don't remember her name, where she did the doll test, uh, where students develop a biases and a and a a visual preference on skin color, among other things, as young as I think. If I remember correctly, like the age of three. So I think it's important for us to support students engaging in meaningful dialogue, being an attentive listener, uh, you know, maybe working your way through these uh, restorative practices uh, processes, because if we're able to effectively articulate what we're thinking and how we're feeling, it can help us be more communicative. And then on the other end, if we're an attentive listener, we get a deeper understanding of each other. Yeah, definitely. I think I teach sixth grade, um, so that's a fun age for us to be kind of starting to have these confrontations. But I definitely agree that it's something that we need to have a conversation about every day. And that's something I'll definitely be taking on next year. So I don't feel uncomfortable if it does happen one day in the classroom. Perfect. And, and I hope that this uh, the template that you have will help again, template framework, not the solution hopefully that will help help you um um you know in the process of of you know having a much more inclusive communicative and restorative environment in your classroom um obviously it's a lot harder what we're managing now as far as remote learning um but technically if you can have a video chat uh with a couple of students you would be able to work your way through this process even like this as well awesome thank so, you yeah thank you for sharing that Anyone else want to share thoughts around this specific scenario or 
a scenario that you've you've been uh, challenged with in your environment, and then let's let's again let's look at how we can apply that that multi-step process, the five-step process within the context of your scenario. So I wanted to say when I was looking at this scenario, which has happened at several of the schools I've worked at. I wasn't thinking so much of this D5 template as I was of the concentric circles and the yeah. impact. And I really like wanted that. And then in terms of like, because it's students from different grade levels, it seems like it's more of a school-wide, something needs to happen school-wide as well as within the individual groups. Because an, an incident like this, everybody knows about it in a very yeah. short amount of time. And so whether that conversation happens with um, with your own individual classes or in advisory groups, uh, but the conversation has to happen. Um, I used to always have class meetings and the minute an incident would come up, we would stop all of the academics and we would circle up and we would have those difficult conversations. Um, and they were amazing. Amazing things came out of them and, um, you know, things that kids uncovered that were going on in their lives. And it was it was huge. Um, but it's, you know, you have to have the difficult conversations. Um, and then there's also that element of like the kid who is getting bullied or is having the racist stuff hurled at them. Like you have to be cognizant of how do you have those conversations without sort of that re-trauma, re-traumatizing or like right. protecting them, but at the same time, going through, so which one is it? It's the one where it's like, you know, not, let's see, I'm looking, what was each person thinking and feeling? And then that one followed with this concentric circles one. And then like, what's really going on with that, those kinds of actions? I don't know. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. And so you touched on another thing, and that's why I went to the slide, which hopefully everyone can see it, back to those concentric circles is, um, you know, I reference it as going from internal to external. What you just talked about is more external down to the internal. Uh, and that's precisely why it's important to look at it as nonlinear. And, you know, you did the uh, you did this too, which is, you know, the myth versus the facts, is you didn't have people, your students just sitting in a circle talking about how they feel. I mean, if you think in terms of a couple of things, so one, by design, circles are inclusive because no one is left out. Everyone should be able to meet up. Every, everyone should be seated or standing in a position where they, think they can make eye contact with everyone in the circle. So that, that way there is the whole idea around the nonverbal communication aspect. Um, and then two, you know, what you shared is also the fact that, which I, I don't know if I shared this early uh, in part one on Monday, is that part of the sustainability of a process like this is being willing to not wait to uh, wait and to address certain issues of conflict or certain situations. And, you know, it, uh, going back to even like uh, this scenario where, um, see where it, uh, it, this is not the first time and since this issue was not previously addressed, it escalated. So again, that's the thing where, okay, if I'm willing to meet the needs of the students and we're going to stop the curriculum and we're going to sit together and we're going to talk and we're going to be open, honest, you know, again, the four agreements and attentive listener. Um, that is one of the most effective ways to mitigate the potential of something escalating. I specifically put this scenario here because I have seen it time and time and time and time and time again where it isn't addressed and it does escalate. And so that's why it's it's important to be able to to be mindful of okay I see what's going on it's time for us to put 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 our regularly regularly scheduled programming on pause so that we can actually uh, get to know each other better have a conversation have a necessary conversation and and again maybe working my way through those protocols around me gathering more information you know putting more of the humanity into the communications that we have so thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I don't want to run out of time. Does anyone else have any commentary about this situation or something that's been specific uh, to you?
Uh, Deb, I believe I just saw you for a moment. You do have your microphone turned on. Feel free to share if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure how to do that. Um, I don't know if it applies to this process, but um, in terms of racial empathy, I found it helpful to do role playing. I work with real young children, but we um, read a story and then we act it out. And um, especially um, about um, Martin Luther King Day, I really bring in a lot of books. And okay. now I'm thinking I should be doing it all year. But I found that kids taking on the role, different roles, um, helps them empathize and it's prevented some things and also gotten other kids to tell their story of being um, discriminated against. And I didn't okay. know what was gone, going on in our school until they did that. So anyway, um, role playing has really helped. So role, role playing can help uh, for sure. I think with role playing, what the, the key is to, uh, you know, essentially go through the equivalent of the debrief process uh, as far as gaining a deeper understanding of that right there. So you've done it. You've done a part of this process actually already, you know, is what have you learned? How has it changed you? Uh, and those sorts of things. Um, where role playing can be dangerous is if you don't follow it up with the empathetic and compassionate understanding of why did we do this? What did you think? How did you feel? What would it feel like to be in that person's uh, uh, shoes or that situation? And how might we be? How might we do things differently? So you are already doing the uh, derivative of the debrief, debrief um, step of this process. Okay. And I would add, um, like, of course, the, the debrief with the group of students that it happened with. But like, sometimes there also needs to be a bigger debrief, like with the class or even with the school, like, and not even, you don't even have to say specific names, like specific names go with the group. But when you talk to, to a bigger group, it's just letting them know, okay, these are some of the things that are happening in our classroom. Let, let's talk about it. Like, you know, then you can see if it's happening to other students, then you can also, then other students can also see, okay, oh, this is a problem. This Let me be part of the solution. So that like, if they ever encounter that, they can speak up or you know even help out in those situations so even having those debriefs with like if it's a specific class have a class debrief and then sometimes you may even have to have like even if it was a grade level debrief just saying these are some of the things that are, have happened and then this is what we did to solve it right mm -hmm. absolutely thank you for sharing that um i would um and this is where it goes into and we're almost out of time, but I know some of you may have some questions specific for me, so I'm going to stick around. But um, to um, the country's point, you know, one of the questions that came up on Monday was, you know, how do we get this program? How do we do it? I would argue the most effective restorative practice and restorative justice program is one that is adopted, implemented and executed school wide with individual components, i.e. the teachers, the counselors, and things of that nature, who adopt different mechanisms following protocols. I mean, like I said, this is a way, not the way. But if you have it as a part of the school culture, it certainly can change the overall disposition of the students, of all of the faculty there, and of the community. So going back to that concentric circle, we're touching on all points of the of all of the circles. Um, I, I, I will say, one one last thing, one last comment around it, around this is um, to Deb, to your point, um, be mindful of, of of role playing as far as what roles being played and who's playing them, uh, because what I have found in some cases with some teachers is they've done role playing and it actually has re traumatized students under that circumstance. So I think it's good to be able to put yourself into the shoes of another to get a deeper understanding of what they're thinking and feeling. Um, my my thing is just to be cautionary around who's playing the roles and what is what is what is occurring within those roles. I always let them choose um, what role. Does that help? Perfect. Like I, yeah, I never ask them to play. Perfect. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Unfortunately, I've seen it where teachers assign it, and um, uh, it it it, it can uh, re-traumatize students. But no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's brilliant. So, does anyone? Uh, we're that was an hour that quick. <laughs> 
Um, does anyone have any specific questions for me around this? You all have gone through part one and part two, and now you have the template. And I'm hopeful that this will support all of you in actualizing ways to implement restorative justice and restorative practices within your specific roles. But um, I do want to be available for any specific questions around this for at least the next few minutes. I don't have a question, but I had an observation early on when we were going over the template. It reminds me so much of peer conflict resolution programs. Mm -hmm. And then in my head, I'm thinking like, because the students would sit down and they would basically go through the steps of this process, maybe an abbreviated version, but we're, <laughs> we're turning that into like, yeah, why have adults not done that as well with the students? So, Bingo. yeah. Bingo. Um, you know, and on a side note, I will share with you, all. I worked with a school district in uh, Pennsylvania that's northwest of Philadelphia. And one of the things that we did uh, was create a student empowerment and student advocacy group that I didn't take them through this specific process yet because of COVID-19 we were supposed to. But ultimately, it was going to your point, it was going to be that the adults do it. And then the kids have a, a derivative of it uh, as well. And you see now you're starting to touch on all the points. And then if you have the administration doing it, and then now you embody that when it comes to reaching out to the community, again, those concentric circles. So um, I do think that it should not be strictly limited to the students doing it for sure. So thank you for sharing that. Anyone else comments, questions? I just wanted to say that this was such, such a great session and the last one was too. So thank you so much for having this platform. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I really wish we could have done this in person, but but I appreciate y'all spending the time with me on this. I know it's not the uh, 50 ways to use Microsoft Office, but I think these are, these are the sessions that are extremely important because ultimately uh, school culture is a driver for uh, individualized learning. So what we've done is gone through a two step, two parts of uh, actualizing one component of what I identify as overall school culture. So I, I appreciate y'all joining me here. And um, again, if anyone else has a question, I can stick around for a few. And I, I hope that the template will certainly give you all additional uh, resource uh, to look at what you're doing within the context of your uh, specific roles. And and again, I, I'm, I keep saying it because I do want to stress it. It is a template and a way by all means, once you start to get develop an awareness of your students, your colleagues, your school, your community, you may find that you start adapting some of the questions that are within each of those steps to be more, more specific to your environments. Thank you for that. And also, thank you so much for putting this on your IG stories. That's how I found out about it. Oh, thank you. I, yeah, I, I, I wasn't I'm sure. And I was actually first, first heard about you from um, Liz from Teach and Transform when you guys had yeah. your live talk. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just uh, I just talked to Liz about two hours ago. So oh, nice. she, she's uh, she's I, I love her. She's one of my favorites. She's thank great. You. Any other questions, comments to share before we uh, enjoy our afternoons or evenings? Just a big thank you. Really appreciate all all your work in all of these different um, content areas. Ken, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then with that, I will say thank you all so much. Uh, please stay safe, stay healthy. And my contact information is on the documents uh, and also I'm on social media. So feel free to reach out if you have any additional follow-up questions or something comes up where you're like, you know, I wanna know what Ken, uh, Ken would uh, think about this or maybe Ken can help me out with this. Um, I can be reached and uh, I will always be available. So I thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.